Hello, you're watching Islaba today for Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Hamza Rifat Hassan. Today's topic is action for environmentalism in the European Union. Now, this is a topic which has been recurring in policy circles all across the world. We all obviously know that the challenge of climate change is pretty much insurmountable at this point in time. And climate change, as well as environmental sustainability, has a trickle-down effect on the local population. I have with me EU Climate Pact Ambassador from Brussels, Mr. Andy Vermont, who's joining me here in the show. And we're going to be discussing the initiatives that he's undertaken, what he believes in, and his advocacy efforts in trying to mitigate the problem that affects Europeans all across the continent. Mr. Andy Vermont, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you for your kind invitation, uh, Mr. Hamza. Yes. Well, I'm glad that you can join us. So, Mr. Andy, while advocating for sustainable farming, environmental protection, we're talking about reduction in pollution, and also an improvement in overall air quality in Europe, what in your views have been the in inadequacies in the European response and are they insurmountable? Well, uh, discussing the European response to sustainable farming and environmental protection, I see three key areas to explore. The implementation speeds, uh, consistency across member states, and a disconnect between policy and practice. Despite the European Union setting enormous ambitious targets, the execution has often been slower than required. Mm -hmm. Factors contributing to this slow pace include political holders, economic constraints, and even a lack of public awareness about the urgency of these issues. As an example, let's delve deeper into sustainable farmer practice practices. Although we have rules to minimize the use of harmful pesticides and to encourage organic farming, the application of these rules varies widely across member states. Understanding the reasons behind these variations can help us to identify potential solutions. Are there economic obstacles that prevent farmers from transitioning to organic, organic methods? Are there even knowledge gaps that need to be addressed? Or are there incentives not strong enough? Answering these questions can guide us towards surmountable actions. And the same principle applies to pollution reduction and improving air quality. Despite having these regulations in Europe, we still witness high pollution levels in numerous cities. The key lies in bridging the gap between high level policy commitments and daily practices. Ensuring consistent enforcement of regulations and incentivizing the green practices could be some of the possible solutions. The answer to overcome all these challenges lies in greater political will, increased societal engagement, and more supportive regulatory environments that drives green innovation and sustainable practices. Reduction in emissions is key to reduce air pollution globally not only in the European Union. Okay, okay, so that, yeah, that's pretty fair enough. So when you talk about reduction in emissions specifically, we all know it's the key for reducing air pollution globally in your view, um, but have European states undertaken concrete steps in capping carbon emissions in comparison to other regions such as Asia? We obviously know for a fact that China is one of the largest emitters of carbon emissions and you know Asia does not necessarily have a very good track record with regard to that. So uh, I would like to, you know, get an idea of your comparative analysis? Well, yes, not an easy question. Um, uh, the European Union undeniably has been a global leader in implementing comprehensive climate legislation. For instance, taking the emission trading scheme, it's the cornerstone of the EU's policy to combat climate change by setting a cap on the total amounts of greenhouse gases. Uh -huh. However, the effectiveness of such a system can always be improved as we must 
continuously strive for more aggressive action, achieving the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement, for instance, calls for an even stronger commitment of everyone. Reflecting further on the issue of sustainable farmer, we can see that this sector is a perfect microcosm for the broader issues that hinder progress towards environmental protection in Europe. This is the same for, for Asia. Despite a policy environment that generally promotes sustainability, the reality on the ground often tells a different story. Farmers, as I said, lack, uh, have sometimes lack of, 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 um, of, 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 of knowledge. This is the same in Asia. When we compare Europe to Asia, we must bear in mind the vast differences in economic, political, and social landscapes across various Asian countries. Some nations like Japan and South Korea have made really significant strides mm -hmm. in capping these emissions, while others like China are still grappling with the basic infrastructural challenges of implementing such measures. Taking a closer look at the emission trading scheme, we see that while it is indeed an innovative and very promising approach to cap carbon emission, it's not without challenges. For instance, the system has been criticized for granting too many free allowances in the past, mm -hmm. which can undermine its effectiveness. Eh? For example, eh, Belgium is buying to other countries. They look a lot of... Uh, so it's not always a good system. The EU has taken steps to address these issues by reducing now the number of allowances over time, but the process of refining and optimizing this system has to continue. Another area where European states could potentially step up their efforts in promoting the development and adaption of renewable energy sources, where Europe has made considerable progress in this area, mm -hmm. renewable energy still accounts also in Europe for a relatively small portion of the overall energy mix in many countries. Accelerating this transition to renewable energy, also in Asia, will require significant investments in infrastructure and technology, as well as policies also in between Europe and Asia that encourage individuals and businesses to choose green energy options. But this costs a lot of money. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the cost is a huge factor when we take into consideration uh, environmental friendly policies. So when we talk about environmental advocacy, uh, you know, in general, are voters in Europe inclined towards voting for green parties, you know, whether that's in Italy, whether that's in Belgium, whether that's in France? Is that the case with the, you know, European population in general? And is that really the case with the rise of populist, uh, populism on the continent? Yeah, we had the green politics has been gaining before sometime a significant momentum in Europe, mm -hmm. which was a very positive indication of the rising environmental consciousness among voters. But this shift has largely been driven by increased awareness and concern about the climate crisis and other environmental challenges. However, as you say, the rise of populism complicates this landscape. While some populist movements are leveraging the growing vote, voter interest in green issues, other use skepticism around climate change and resistance to environmental regulations as a way to rally support. This adds a very difficult layer of complexity to the political dynamics that ultimately influence environmental policies and practices. Yeah. The rise of green parties and populist movements in Europe can be seen as two sides of the same coin. On the one hand, we have the growing popularity of green parties reflects a growing societal recognition of these importance of these environmental issues. On the other hand, 
the rise of populist movements often reflects a dissatisfaction with the status quo for change and a desire for change. In some cases, this desire for change can manifest as a backlash against the perceived elite's consensus on issues such as climate change. In order to ensure that environmental concerns remain at the forefront of the political agenda, it's important for also the Green parties, for the Green parties, very important, and for all environmental advocates to communicate their message in a, very, in a much better way that resonates with a wide, wide range of voters. This includes addressing concerns about the potential economic impact of transitioning to a greener economy and showing how green policies can lead to job creation and economic growth. We should be very, very uh, clear about this. We should be uh, very open about this, also about the social injustice sometimes uh, who is uh, linked to, uh, oh, a lot of people say to me, uh, yeah, we uh, people who ride with the bus, a Tesla in Europe, they don't have to pay, they have to pay less taxes, uh, road taxes, for example. This is something who a normal person who cannot buy such a car, he doesn't understand that he, he cannot get uh, um, uh, the same tax policies. So we have to, th this has to be social just, the changes. And is the change is social just, then I think uh, we can overcome this populism. Okay, fair enough. So when you speak about the protection of vulnerable populations on the continent, who are you specifically referring to? Well, yeah, <laughs> vulnerable populations, I refer always to them as those who are most affected by environmental changes and climate change. We saw what happened in Pakistan. We see what happens in Bangladesh. Eh? So we see this includes groups that face more significant health risk from one, on the one hand, poor air, air quality, such as those living near high pollution areas, like European centers or heavy industries. These are vulnerable people. But vulnerability also pertains to geographical factors. For example, people living in areas prone to extreme weather condition caused by climate change. Also, the economical disadvantage groups often have less capacity to adapt to changes in their environment. And hence, be it the economic and health impacts of pollution and climate change disproportionately. Addressing the needs of these vulnerable populations requires targeted policies that focus on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. In addition to these geographical and also the economical factors, other factors can contribute to vulnerability. For instance, age, health status, and occupation can all affect a, person a person's ability to cope with these environmental changes. Also income levels. Elderly people, elderly people, for example, and those with pre-existing health condition are often more susceptible to the effects of air pollution and extreme weather events. Likewise, people who, whose livelihoods depend on the environment, such as farmers, fishers, may be particularly affected by the changes in climate patterns. So these are vulnerable people. Protecting these vulnerable populations requires not only the mitigating of the effects of environmental change, but also to promote more social policies worldwide that enhance resilience. This could include providing social safety nets, improving better access to healthcare, and promoting job diversifications in areas heavily dependent on climate sensitive sectors. Okay, so Andy, finally, uh, what in your view are the su supply side measures that need to be undertaken by European governments in the post pandemic and Ukraine war era? Yes, um, a lot has to be done. This era presents a unique opportunity for a paradigm shift towards a green economy, 
supply side, supply side measures could encompass a range of strategies. First, firstly, I think governments should invest heavily in green innovation, which could include research and development subsidies for companies and people creating green technologies. Secondly, implementing stringent environmental standards across all sectors could drive market forces toward cleaner in technology. So all the sectors need to be addressed, not only one sector. Thirdly, investing in renewable energy infrastructure is essential. The recent Ukraine conflict underscored the risk of energy dependence and hence the importance of diversifying our energy mix. A resilient and sustainable food system could only be fostered by promoting regenerative agriculture, encouraging local food chains and reassessing agriculture subsidies to ensure they do not inadvertently promote harmful practices. The post-pandemic and post-Ukraine war era is a wake up call to build this more resilient, sustainable and equitable future. And these measures could pave the way for a better future for us all. Looking at the bigger picture, it's clear that the transition to a greener economy is not just an environmental imperative, but also a fantastic economic opportunity. The green sector can be a source of job creation and economic growth. However, to tap into this potential government's need to create a conductive environment for green businesses to thrive. This could include providing financial incentives for green startups. We should invest also more in education and training to equip the workforce with all the necessary skills for these green jobs of the future and create this regulatory framework that encourages all these sustainable business practices so we can save the world together. In the aftermath of the pandemic and the Ukraine war, these measures could help stimulate economic recovery while also paving the way for a more sustainable future for us all. Moreover, they could help enhance Europe's energy security by reducing the dependence on these imported fossil fuels. EU Climate Pact Ambassador, Mr. Andy Verma, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Thank you. That's all that we have from Islamba today on Think Tech Hawaii. I was your host, Hamza Rifa Hassan. Until next time, take care. You can follow us on social media for all the latest updates. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.